Greetings, fellow Mana Lords, Radamon here. Thank you for tuning in to the very first episode of a six part series playing Mana Lords. In this six part series, you will not only learn how to play the game, but also how to play well, and I hope I do keep you entertained throughout. If you would like to skip the game's overview or the setup of the scenario, please use YouTube chapters. Welcome everybody to a brand new series playing Mana Lords. It is a medieval strategy game where you assume the role of a lord. You build and expand your small homestead into a vast city, or even a network of multiple cities, all while defending your land from bandits and barons. The game is inspired by 14th century Franconia, and is designed for the player to build organically, forming townships that feel more real and believable than min-max grids of many other games. Um, and before this stream, I pulled my YouTube community about what scenario to play, and uh, the majority voted for restoring the peace. So let me show you the three scenarios now. Uh, let's say my name is Rad. And, you know, I'm kind of bald with a beard, so I'll go that. So there's three different scenarios. Rise to Prosperity, which is a non-combat scenario. Has no bandits, has no raiders, nothing like that. Uh, and the goal is to reach a large town settlement level, and then it kind of goes to an endless mode. There is On the Edge, which is a uh, more or less like a wave survival where bandits keep showing up and attack you, uh, but there's no other barons for you to fight. So it's mostly just like beating up bandits. And then there's the Restoring the Peace. Two territories in the north are claimed by the illegitimate barons whose castle is located off the map. Bandit camps reside in the other unclaimed regions, Build and expand at your own pace. When ready, challenge the barons uh, for the northern territories. And the victory condition is conquer every region. Now, I will give you a fair bit of warning. Um, having tried to play the challenging difficulties, sometimes the game isn't balanced to do it. So I was trying to do like on the edge on challenging. And I think it's actually functionally impossible. Uh, the demands that your colonists have uh, means that they abandon your colony within the first, like, five minutes of gameplay, and there's no amount of, like, min-maxing to fix it. So, I'm gonna only be playing on default difficulty, because I don't think the challenging difficulty actually works all that well. It's kind of broken in many instances. Um, so let's get into it. Oh, also, it's worth mentioning that, yes, this is early access, and also, uh, there's only one map, it's the early access map. I will also preface that, in my experience, the game is quite challenging if you do not start on a fertile tile. And I'm going to have you guys decide whether I re-roll a map, which would only take me like 30 seconds, or to go with the challenges of um, not having a fertile tile. I'm okay with either. All right, we are in the middle of the region. So these are the two other barons, as you can see up here in their diplomacy. And uh, the center region, I don't, I haven't checked its fertility, but uh, let me not get ahead of myself. I'm gonna read these messages. Build up your town, your manor, and when ready, press claims towards other regions owned by your opponents. Once a claim has been pressed, be ready for battle. I'll unite these lands under my rule. So that's more or less the victory condition. It's not tracked, you just have to remember it. Um, so before I start playing at all, uh, let me check the fertility. So wheat is good, and barley is fine, flax is fine. Okay, yeah, I can play this map tile. If you take a look at the fertility overlays, as you can see, some of the map tiles just don't have, like, like let's say I was up here, this doesn't have barley fertility, which means uh, I would need to import my barley or buy it from the trading markets, so on and so forth. But the center tile is fertile enough, it's fine. Um, so going over the user interface, I have the game paused, the time controls are down here. Pause, normal, fast forward, four and 12. Um, you also have the season here, I know my head's a little in the way, but it's spring, summer, autumn, winter. And then in the spring, um, seasonal deposits regrow like berries, uh, which you can harvest. In the summer, crops grow, you possibly get droughts. In the autumn, it's your harvesting season where you plow and sow. And then the winter, um, you heavily relied on firewood for heating. 
Uh, on the top left, you've got unassigned, your unassigned families. So instead of having individual workers, your families are assigned to specific uh, work. So like a family will move into the berry pickers. A family will move into the stone mine. It's uh, per family. Uh, so five uh, unassigned families means that they are going to be transporting timber for construction if they're unassigned. And then the zero is how many are assigned. Uh, this is the living space, how many burbages or houses you have. Uh, the total population, um, and it's mixed with uh, different levels of families. You have levels one, two, and three. And in this case, I have five level one families that are eight male, two female. Um, your approval, which will be affected by uh, recreation through the tavern, the church, um, food variety, and whether you bury the dead, that kind of thing. Uh, public order, which... Really, honestly, I don't think is a game mechanic that exists yet. Not really. But, like, when people get drunk, there's a little bit of disorder. But I haven't actually seen a cause and effect of a lack of public order yet. Uh, regional wealth. Uh, so, regional wealth is a way... There is personal wealth of your own player, which is up here in the top right. And regional wealth allows you to make investments into your region. Um, so, personal wealth can be used to hire out, like, mercenaries or a private retinue of soldiers. Regional wealth allows you to... Um, build special facilities and housing and uh, hire and pay for trade caravans, things like that. Uh, then this is how much livestock you have. So you start off with one oxen, uh, which is useful to haul around timber for construction. And you can buy oxen, horses, and mules. Mules are used to trade between regions. Oxen and horses are used for construction and transportation. And then there's also sheep if you want wool uh, as a textile. The next one is an important one to keep your eye on. It is how many months you have until you die, more or less. Um, so I have four months of food and no stockpile of fuel, uh, but it is March and I don't really need fuel until the winter. Um, then, of course, you can click here, which is your, um, your current settlement level. What you have to do to level up your settlement, which is to get five beverages uh, at level one. And then if you click it, you have your technological development uh, a lot of these options are works in progress, as you can see. They don't exist yet. And then some of them are really powerful, and some of them don't do much at all. So, for instance, heavy plow, allowing your oxen to plow your farm fields is amazing. Um, surprisingly enough, like, making your own armor is pretty garbage. Uh, straight up garbage, because you can just easily pay for armor instead. So it's kind of a wasted point. And you only gain these development points when you level up your town level, which means... But you only get, I think, like five, maybe, total. So you don't unlock all of them. You really have to pick and choose. Um, then policies, which uh, most of them don't exist either. And the starting policies kind of suck. It's like you're better at hunting and picking berries, but you can't farm or people skip their fifth meal and they're upset. Like they're policies that you wouldn't necessarily even want to enact. Uh, and then the other policies up here are just like works in progress. So it's totally missing. Uh, and then the production tab, I have no idea what that does because it doesn't do anything. It's just empty. Um, all right, going along up here, you have your resources. So construction, food, fuel, crops, crafting materials, commodities, and military. Um, and then on the top right, you have your treasury, your personal wealth. You have your annual royal tax to be paid, which I don't believe is a game mechanic yet. You have your King's Favor, which again is not a game mechanic yet. And then Influence, which allows you to press claims against your neighbors or empty territories to claim them with influence. A thousand influence per territory or two thousand to conquer your neighbors or uh, engage war with your neighbors. At the bottom, you have a roads tool uh, to build roads. The roads that you start off with, these big wide ones, are king roads, which cannot be destroyed. You're stuck with the roads that you start with. But your own roads can be built and destroyed at no cost, and they're done instantly. Uh, then the construction tab. Um, so you've got your different tabs here. You've got gathering for wood-based stuff, food, and hunting. You've got mining for stone, clay, or iron. You've got logistics for granary, where you store your food, or storehouse, where you store your supplies. A pack station, which allows you to transfer between two different regions that you own. Or... Um, a hitching post, which allows you to store more animals like oxen for construction and transportation. Next up is your residential tab, 
Uh, so you've got your uh, burgage plots, which is your basic housing units, and I'll go into those more in detail. Wells for supplying water. Marketplace for setting up places for people to buy their food, firewood, clothing. Um, these are locked behind tech, which is firewood cart and food cart. Um, taverns for entertainment. Church for faith requirement. And then corpse pit if you are you know have a lot of dead bodies around. Next up is farming. Um, so you have farm fields and farmhouses. People hired in the farmhouse will work in the fields. And it's important to note that there is ground fertility. So rye is a little bit easier to grow wherever the hell you want, but it is locked behind the tech tree. Uh, so make sure whenever you're planting your crop fields to plan to build them somewhere fertile and to rotate them accordingly. Um, emmer is wheat. Uh, and I know my overlay is covering it, so let me hide my overlay for a second. Uh, emmer is wheat, which is going to be the backbone of a lot of your food supply, because uh, it's pretty much the only thing you can grow. Uh, because apart from emmer, you relied upon uh, berries, which are seasonal, hunting, which is pretty limited, and then some extra food, and I'll get into that in a little bit later. Um, so if you don't have a source of emmer on your map tile that's, like, rich, uh, you're gonna run into some problems, and I'll tell you later how to fix those. Uh, flax is for clothing, but there's a bunch of different ways to get clothing. So you can grow flax, you can hunt for leather, hides to turn them into leather, or you can have sheep pastures for wool. So you don't necessarily need to grow flax. You will, however, need to grow barley. Um, there is not a substitute for barley, so barley, uh, allows you to make malt for your uh, taverns, which is a requirement to grow your towns. And then rye is just a replacement for wheat uh, that is a little bit more flexible because it's more uh, it's more robust. Um, a windmill to grain, uh, to, to grind up grain to flour, and then a communal oven to bake bread. And there's other ways to bake bread too. Uh, the next tab is industry. So you have a bloomery, which turns iron ore into slabs. You have a smithy, which turns iron slabs into tools. Uh, tools allow you to craft more successfully. Without tools, you have a chance to fail at crafting when you try. Uh, clay furnaces to turn clay into clay tiles for roofing, which is useful to uh, get high-level houses and high-level church. Uh, a malt house to turn barley into malt. And then you have a tannery, a weavery, and a dyer workshop, all for fabrics. The next one is trade. A trading post to trade with the edge of the map, where they will walk in and um, you'll buy stuff from the trade posts. And then a livestock trading post. The same deal, but for livestock. Uh, the second to last tab is the Settler's Camp. So the Settler's Camp allows you, if you, like, let's say I had a thousand influence and I pressed a claim and then owned this territory, I could build a Settler's Camp there to start a new town. If you're wondering, no, you can't have one giant sprawling metropolis. Each individual region is, it's each individual region. So like, let's say I own this area here. I wouldn't be able to have a city that spans between the two. They can trade resources, um, but that's it. They can't trade people. Uh, they have their own armies. They have their own buildings. They have their own administration. They're effectively just running two towns at once. Um, and then the manor, which is your administrative building, which unlocks tax policies and other policies. Um, and then cosmetic stuff, like remo removing shrubbery or building little shrines, which are cosmetic only. All right, so first order of business for us here is to figure out where we're actually going to build. So what I want to do is to make sure that I don't build where barley and wheat are fertile. So we have a bunch of uh, fertile barley over here. Basically, the whole place is fine for wheat. As you can see, it's all green, so this is fine. Um, so I'm mostly focused on, like, where can I put barley? And it looks like barley can be really grown in the northeast corner and then the southwest corner that has a lot of forests. So I think probably building the town right around here in the center where it's open uh, is going to be pretty ideal. So what I'm going to do, uh, whoa, okay. What I'm going to do right at the start is to go to my starting camp, which is here, and upgrade this to a worker camp. And then set it to highest priority. Uh, if you don't do this, your people will be homeless and it will make it more difficult for you to attract immigrants. It's also worth noting that you have a finite amount of timber at the start. So I have seven timber after doing that uh, workers camp. So that workers camp is gonna be able to house the five families that I have. 
Uh, so what I want to do next is to get a logging camp to gain a, an income of wood. Now, it's also worth noting, I don't want to build it too close to this hunting grounds because I, they will migrate away if I um, envelop their area. So if I'm building the town, it might be worth building pretty much where this stone deposit is, um, interestingly enough. Or maybe somewhere right around here, actually. Because if you go too far from the worker camp, the transportation times for construction can be pretty penalizing. So let's say I do plan to build the town sort of in this section here, which does more or less overlap with some of the barley zones. So if I make it more closer to this stone um, deposit, I think that would be best. So I'm going to put the logging camp here. And these things are pretty cheap to build and you can always move them. So the logging camp is going to be on high priority, very high priority, and then the worker camp on the highest. And I'm going to unpause. And what you'll see is you'll see people grab the, the oxen from the hitching post and then bring timber to the work camp to transport that timber for its construction. All right, the next thing I want to do is to um, start to gather food because without a income of food, uh, well, people starve. So I'm going to build a gatherer's hut here, which is very close to the bush here, bush deposit. And then I'm going to build Actually, you know what? I don't want that right now. I'm going to pause that. I'm going to leave it there, but I'm going to keep it paused. Instead, I'm going to rely a little bit more on hunting initially. So I'm going to build a hunter's camp um, right here. The advantage of hunting is hunting will also give you hides, which you can turn into leather for clothing, whereas berries you can turn into clothing dyes, but clothing dyes alone don't fulfill clothing requirements. They are part of clothing requirements paired with... Um, linen which is spun by f by growing flax so it's easier to get clothing through hunting although i'll be a, a finite amount uh because there's only so much hunting grounds now it is worth noting that in every region there is something there's one or two resources that it is particularly rich in so if you take a look up here this has a wild a rich deposit of wild animals so it has double the amount of wild animals than my tile that has 20 this has 40 um this one has like a rich iron deposit of 2,000 iron. I, in my tile, have a rich stone deposit of 1,000 stone. Uh, so there are strategic resources where there are resource rich areas. Um, my two cents, I would say the best ones to probably have would be like berry deposits. I uh, That would be my inclination because feeding yourself is actually somewhat of a bit of a challenge in this game. All right, so we got that workers camp built. Uh, we are now building the logging camp. And then after the logging camp, we'll build the hunting camp. Uh, then we need a place to actually store the food. So um, I think it makes most sense to put the granary where the farms will eventually go. Which will be over here-ish. So I'm going to put the granary actually relatively close to this berry deposit. And then I'm going to run a road from the berry gathering shack down to the king's road down here running right alongside this logging camp actually i would like for it to be even closer to the logging camp so it looks like uh like that so the logging camp comes at a crossroads and then i'll put the granary up here next to the forger hut and then I'll put the storehouse, which is for your non-perishable things to be uh, used, uh, right next to the logging camp. Trying to limit uh, transportation times. And these things are going to be on medium um, build priority. I really want the hunter and the logger first. So this is the very basic setup. It's also worth noting that my neighbors here do not exist. Their map tiles will not get built up villages or towns or anything. They will have armies that kind of appear out of nowhere. Uh, as the game states, they are off tile and they just own these claims. So it's never like there's other structures on the map. Um, which is maybe unexpected. 
All right. The next thing we want to start to do is to think about uh, where we're going to put our houses. And I'll get into that once the logging camp and the hunting camp get built. But the housing in this game is a little bit different than normal games. Uh, I would also like to put a well down, uh, but I don't have enough timber at the moment. I'm just waiting for the logging camp to be, get built so I have the timber. But yeah, you can see the various families here traveling to go build things. All right, so the logging camp got built, and we're going to hire, uh, let's say, three families to go log for us. So up here, as you can see, three are assigned and two are unassigned. And a new message. I've heard of your renown. I only seek to defend my rights and my honor against those who would wrong me. I hope you will not judge me by the rumors and slanders that some may spread about me. So this is Huldebolt. Uh, and I don't even want to talk to him. In fact, there's not really negotiations to be done. Um, you could do a war surprise or whatever, but like there's fundamentally not a lot of diplomacy included in the game yet. All right, so the hunting camp just got done. And I'm going to assign one of the families to the hunting camp. So now I have one free family to do construction. Three that are acquiring timber and one that is hunting these wild animals. The hunting camp here, uh, to show you the work camps, um, this specific hunting camp can hire up to two people. There's a hunting limit. So they'll stop hunting when the population of the wild animals drops to 10 so that they don't hunt them into extinction. Uh, here's the individual people that are doing the hunting. So... Uh, Beatrix, Viet, and Heinz. Um, and then you could also set their work area if you want. In the case of hunting camps, there's only one resource node of wild animals, so I don't really need to do that. But in the case of like a logging camp, for instance, if I went to the work zone, I can hold left control and mouse wheel and tell them to actually start clear cutting the trees uh, that are here, which is roughly where my farms are going to go. So now that we're actually building up a little bit of a source of timber, uh, I can go ahead and get uh, a well down. So I'm going to build a well there. And we'll start planning the towns. So I want to talk about how to design a town layout that is somewhat efficient and effective. So the way they work is that the houses closest to your marketplace, which gives them food, clothing, and firewood, and also closest to the tavern and wooden church, are the ones that get serviced. Um, in this game, it doesn't necessarily make sense for all of your houses to be of the same tier. There's three tiers, and the higher the tier, the more demanding it is. There is very much a reason to have low-tier housing, because they can supply a lot of labor without a lot of cost. Uh, so, when planning your towns, the higher the tier of the house, the more they pay taxes to the regional wealth. So there is an advantage to having higher level housing, but... Uh, for everyone to have a level 3 house is kind of unrealistic. Just to set that up. So when you're laying out a town, what you want to do is you want to lay out the town around a marketplace, tavern, and church. And I don't have the resources right now to build a tavern or church, nor would they even benefit from it at the moment. Uh, so instead, what we're going to do is plan it around a marketplace. Now, my logging camp is here, so I'm going to plan around this area. This is kind of open and easy to build around because I don't want to run into too many like physical obstructions. So I'm going to make some of my own roads and put a marketplace here. Now in your marketplaces, you can sort of paint how they are laid out. Um, there's a few different concepts here. You can either have one very large central marketplace. The advantages of that is you can build up around it. The disadvantages is, is people that live on the fringes are probably not going to get services. Uh, I will build like a, a rather large central one and then probably some additional satellites. So this has enough for 12 stalls. Let's go for like 16, 19. That's too many. 
And nothing needs to be really square, as you'll see in a second. Wow. Come on now. All right, 15. That's fine. So there we go. We have a central marketplace. Um, paired with the marketplace, we're going to want the granary and the storehouse. So the people in the granary and their storehouse will set up stalls in the marketplace in order to sell the goods from the storehouse. And the other thing that we're going to want to build pretty early on here is the Woodcutter's Lodge. So Woodcutter's Lodge makes firewood, whereas the logging camp makes construction timber. They're fundamentally different, uh, not to be confused, because without a Woodcutter's Lodge, you will not be able to uh, keep warm in the winter and people will move out or die. And, you know, we're trying to avoid that, I suppose. All right, so now with that center marketplace, um, what I can do is I can plan on eventually having the services buildings, like a tavern here and a church here, building up around the center. So here is the way the Burgage plots work. Um, this is a good first example. Let me rotate. So the way to read this is that this plot is for one house with one expansion slot and one backyard facility. The extension slot allows you to put more people into a house. And then the backyard facility is way, way, way more important. And I'll explain why. And this is a little bit of my own personal opinion, but I'm going to try to justify it. Each house has the possibility to have special facilities in it. So initially it allows you to like have a, uh, a carrot guard or vegetable garden in your backyard or goats in your backyard for hides or chickens in your backyard for eggs. It essentially supplements your food supply. So in my opinion, pretty much every single house should have the backyard e extension slot. Now this, this plus slot here, not so important. And the reason is you are judged the size of your village by how many buildings you have. And these uh, bonus slots don't affect the sediment level. So... You can build uh, each plot to be ideal with both the extension and the added housing size. I just don't think the added housing size is useful. And there's a few different reasons. One is that the proximity to the, um, to the marketplace is essentially what limits uh, access to the marketplace. And you can build much more compact housing if you don't have those expansion slots. Um, and then also, it's just going to be easier to meet your goals. So as you can see, I can paint multiple houses at once. Uh, so that was four houses in that spot. And if I wanted those with the extension slots, you know, I would be, maybe be able to fit two. Um, so you can play around with that. But in my experience, the, the more housing that you have, probably the better. So let's lay out our first houses with backyards. Soon the beating sun. And paint it just right so that it has the extension slots. The extension slots are the really important parts. And as you can see, you can have it be really oddly shaped. Like you don't have to be rectangular at all in, in this instance. Uh, so you can really go wild if you want. Wow, really does not want this place to have a backyard. All right, fine. I will fight you. I'm going to build multiple at once. And what you're aiming to do is to probably have like six or seven houses right at the start. And uh, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to build them space efficient because space is at a premium around the markets. So you want to fit as many houses around your markets as possible. So I'm just going to wait until I get a little bit more timber because that's what I'm bottlenecked on. So the initial houses, what I'm putting in here, are going to be houses that are eventually going to be the high-level houses because they're at the center of the town. Um, so I'm trying to design houses that are uh, sort of packed together, and then as they get out from the center, they will become more expansive uh, with, like, apple orchards or, or chicken farms. And the houses in the center of town are going to be the production ones that makes bows and shields and spears and things like that. Uh, that's kind of the design I'm going to go with. 
Alright, I have eight timber, so that should be enough for four houses. So we'll get the first four houses going now. Come on. Yeah, three. Game's like, hmm, the best I could do is three. Oh, there we go. That's, uh, that's pretty decent. I'll commit to that. Another thing I'd like to do is to pretty early on get a second hitching post. I'm going to put the hitching post right next to my storehouse uh, so that we have an extra oxen to help construct and transfer goods. And the idea here is, as soon as I am able to move the worker camps out of the worker camps and put them into actual housing, the better. I don't want them in temporary worker camps because that is upsetting in the long run. All right, let me turn the overlays back on. So current priority is set up a starting town. Okay, granary's done. I'm not going to have everyone, anyone work in the granary just yet. Um, but eventually the people that work in the granary can f set up food stalls um, for your markets. So right now, I have a food stall in the market from the hunter. So in this case, the hunter. If I take a look at the people in the hunter. Um, one of them has show set up a food stall here where they are going to sell uh, meat. So this is essentially a meat stall. So generally speaking, as you can see, you assign house, uh, families, not individuals. Uh, some of the individuals are going to be doing the actual hunting, and some of the individuals are going to be transporting it and selling it in the food stalls. All right, so we are using the oxen to transport uh, the timber to the Burgage uh, plots so that we can get some lovely proper housing and not a worker camp and here you can see the oxen being transported by Endelin, who's one of the unassigned families so construction requires free oxen in other words and now that all of the supplies are delivered other unassigned people like this one And this one will be flattening the plots and building the houses. Alright, now uh, that I have the second hitching post, I am going to order another ox to be purchased. Uh, my first hitching post is over here next to the worker camp. And this hitching post will get moved at some point, but not right now, because if I move it right now, it will kind of interrupt construction. And here is a burgage plot. And your burgage plot requires all of these amenities and market supplies to be met in order to level up to the next tier. And then this is the backyard extension. So the backyard extensions can be vegetable garden, chicken coop, goat shed for vegetables, eggs, or hides. You can eventually unlock apple orchards uh, through the development tree. And then once they're a higher level house or burgage, uh, you can get a bake bakery extension, blacksmithy, brewer. So most of your advanced crafting is actually done through ext uh, extension slots. Um, you can make tools in a smithy, but you can't, for instance, make spears or sidearms or shields or wooden parts, or shoes, or any of that. So what this allows you to do, what this requires you to do, is to plan for your individual houses to eventually become businesses. Uh, because if you want, let's say, war bows, you're going to need to set up one of these houses uh, at a higher level, burgage, and then, uh, then to turn them into a boyer to make war bows. 
And then that family that lives there is only going to make war bows. That's their permanent job from there on out. They have dedicated themselves to be Fletchers and Boyers. All right, so we'll get the other houses, and I did mention wanting to get six. So what I'm going to do is uh, lay two out right here. There we go. Oh, with the six initial slots. And families are already starting to move in there. So now I have six families. So, um... The original families that live in the worker camp, yeah, they didn't even really get to move into the nice houses that they built. Rude, I know. But that's just how it goes. Okay. Uh, at this point... I'm also going to allow, now that we're starting to grow, the forger hut to be built. Uh... We'll get those buildings going. So the current goal right now is to get uh, five Burgess plots. Uh, I have six already queued up, so it's just a matter of time that they're built. Uh, and that will allow us to uh, become a small village, which will give us a development point. And I'm also going to choose to add vegetable gardens to these plots. So as you can see, the backyard just got changed into a vegetable garden where they will grow vegetables which will allow me to supplement the meat and berries that I am foraging and hunting for with some extra vegetables as another food source. So that's why the extension slots are so important. Not only are they eventually the way for you to make weapons and armor and bows and the like, uh, but they're also very powerful tools to use your regional wealth to invest it uh, for food production or whatever you feel you're missing. Might have nerfed the uh, music a little too much. And then if we click on the marketplace and mouse over the fuel, food variety, and clothing, you can actually see that this house right now is not supplied with anything. But that's mostly just because it was first built. Just built a second ago. And here is someone plowing the land, building the vegetable garden that I just paid for. And both of the timber just got delivered to this burgage plot, so we're getting our houses built. There's number two. And I'm going to do a vegetable garden in that one as well. So now I don't have any more regional wealth, but I've invested it, which I think is probably a healthy thing to do early on. Lovely looking map. And as soon as I have, have enough open housing for the workers in this worker camp to move in, all five of their families, uh, I will break down that worker camp because I don't want them living there forever. All right, no storage left in the honey camp. So this honey camp filled up. Um, so what's going to be needed to be done here is to put someone at work in the uh, storehouse and put someone at work in the granary so that the hunting camp can be emptied out. And then I'm going to fire one of the loggers so that they can become constructors again. Because if you don't have any unassigned families, nothing gets built ever. As it, they're the builders, effectively. So now with people working in the storehouse and granary, uh, we'll also probably see some additional marketplaces set up as a result. Yep, there's a firewood stall that just opened up. I have five months of food, seven months of fuel. Uh, soon I'm going to want to hire a woodcutter as well. 
Oh, someone just moved in. So let's hire that woodcutter now. To bolster our fuel. And then I would like to collect berries while the season's hot. So I'm going to increase the priority of the forager's hut so we can collect these berries because they're seasonal. And uh, I'm going to lose the opportunity if I wait too long. I am sort of curious if I can fit. Okay, that's an extension house. I'll build one of them. Just so that you can see the difference between the two. As like an educational tool. Why not? Okay, my oxen has come. That's great. Uh, another work priority that I want to set up now is a saw pit. A saw pit takes timber and saws it into uh, planks. Uh, and planks are going to be needed if we want to build a church. Also, are these houses too far from the well? No, they have water access. Okay. Now, I do have a little bit of homelessness. I am working on it. We have double the oxen hauling the timber. And this forger hut will be built any second now. Right, I do have a lot of stockpile timber, so I'm going to fire both of my loggers so that they're working as constructors because I have 65 timber now built up. Putting one of them as a forager and then leaving the other one unassigned so he can build. Thank you for tuning in to Mana Lords, which originally streamed live on Twitch April 16th. If you have any feedback or questions for me, let me know in the comments below. If you would like to catch a live stream of mine, Rodamont.com has my stream schedule and countdown timers to upcoming streams. If you would like to join my online gaming community on Discord, Rodamont.com has a link to it, as does the description of this video. Thank you so very much for watching, and a special thank you to my Patreon patrons, Twitch subscribers, and viewers like you that support the channel and made it all the way to the credits. Thank you so very much. Hope to catch a next episode or an upcoming stream. Farewell, my fellow manor lords. <laughs>